Hello and welcome to Let's Talk with Bishop R.C. Blakes. R.C. is an author, empowerment teacher and the proud pastor of the New Home Ministries of New Orleans, Louisiana and Houston, Texas. His message circles the globe. His conversational and candid approach to challenging content makes him a relevant voice to all generations. Get ready for a life-changing transformational conversation. Hello, 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 hello. This is R.C. Blakes and welcome back to another Let's Talk with R.C. Blakes. I am so excited about um, just my conversation for us tonight. Uh, I really would love for you to invite some others to come in and to be a part of our conversation tonight. I'm talking straight, um, really I'm talking straight at the sisters tonight, uh, really from an empathetic place today. Uh, I was looking at, um, you know, really not diving deep because I, I just didn't have the time to really dig as deep, but I was looking at, um, well, before I say that, let me say this. Tonight, we're kind of discussing the power of a woman that conquers, you know, her pain, her past, and she reconciles all of that and comes into a place where she does not feel the need um, to have the world's stamp of approval. When a woman gets to that place where you know, this is what I've gone through. This is, this has been my journey. And, you know, everything that I've gone through has made me who I am. When a woman gets to that point and she understands that, you know, her process, um, did not define her rather it refined her because so many so many women are still hiding out in you know in a place of uh shame because of the realities of your process you can't define an object you know at the beginnings of um what is the thing called? Um, you know, the beginnings of the um, assembly line. You know, if, if there are 10 steps to the finishing of a product, you can't define the product at step three. And there are so many women who have gone through all of the steps and you've come out, you know, a whole powerful queen of a woman, but your psychology and the toxic world that you're surrounded by wants to make you define yourself by the marred condition you were in at step three, ignoring the fact that you went through step four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And now you can't even celebrate the finished product because you're still defining yourself by something that happened at step three. And so I know that women carry, you know, uh, women carry the shame and women carry the pain of the past. Um, I think in a lot of ways and a lot of times in greater ways than we do as men. But I know for myself, <clears throat> excuse me, as a man, how I define myself for the longest based on being that 15 year old, you know, um, father, unwed teen father, clearly, you know. And it took me the longest to get to a point where. I understood that that part of my life 
plays into who I am now. And though I, I went through that part of my life, it did not define me, it refined me. And so I can stand in who I presently am without any shame relative to who I was at stage three on the assembly line. But there are many of you that are watching me right now and, you know, you have the career, you love God, uh, you, you may even have the family or you may have the relationship you desire, but you have these secrets that you don't want to face, you don't want anybody to discover because you want to continue you know, <clears throat> with the idea that you've always been what you are. But anybody with a half a brain knows that none of us have always been what we presently are. Pain and shame and mistakes and error, these things are uh, a universal human experience. And it comes in different forms, you know. We have physical pain, we have emotional pain, we have mental pain. And while it's common to keep our painful realities to ourselves, there are practical benefits to getting to a place where you're able to just face it, own it, and understand that it does not devalue you at all. You know, and what I was getting ready to mention is I saw recently how the young, I don't know what she does, I don't know if she's a singer or I don't know, the young lady Black China. I, I know she's very popular, but you know, I mean I'm I'm not that involved in hip hop hip hop culture to exactly know who she who she is. But I saw her story and I saw just I just got some glimpses of you know, how her mindset has shifted. And it was, it was a gentleman that, uh, Damon Jones, that sent me a link to how this young lady has gotten baptized and she's taken out all of the augmentations. And, and that's not to speak poorly of anybody that has augmentations. I mean, if that's your thing, that's your thing. And, and she's just come back, she, her, uh, what I read was, she said, I just want to get back to whatever her legal name is. Black China is like her brand name, but her legal name was something else. She says, I want to get back to this person. And she's kind of, um, you know, she's kind of uh, empowering herself to own her history, but to definitely move into her destiny. Now, here's the sad thing I have to say. Here's the sad thing. Um, more women, more men were, I don't know what it is presently, but more men were complimenting and celebrating her being able to own her mistakes and move into a positive future, while women were berating her, degrading her, trying to humiliate her, you know, bringing up what she's done in the past. That's sad because every woman has a past. If, you li if you've lived any length of time at all, every woman has a past. Now, the difference between you and Black China is that your past was probably not captured on video film documented. You probably didn't have uh, paparazzi following you around documenting your every move, but a lot of the women that, you know, are down on her have as um, controversial of a past as she does. The difference between her and them again many times is that they're trying to paint this image that they've always been where they are and they've not owned their past. And that is a prison to itself. When you're always trying to figure out 
if somebody's going to finally figure out that I'm not who I'm portraying to be, I think that is probably the greatest engine uh, for imposter syndrome. When you can sit with your past and you can say, okay, yeah, this is what I did and this is who I was and uh, I learned this from it, I learned that from it, and that's where I was, but this is who I am, this is where I am now. You're free. And every powerful woman has to come to a point in time where you conquer your past, where you 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 understand that step three on the assembly line does not define you, did not define you, cannot define you. You are defined, you are actually being defined in the finished, constantly refining product. Jesus one day met a woman that I love to talk about, and if you've listened to me any length of time, you pretty much know who I'm going to, and it's that woman at the well. And I love, I love the encounter between Jesus and that woman because of a lot of different reasons, and I don't want to go into that because I want to get to the points. In, but in John chapter 4, verses 15 through 19, you read the whole story. Well, let me just pull these verses out. The Bible says, the woman saith unto him, sir, give me this water. Jesus says to her, I have some water that if I gave to you, you, you know, you'll never thirst again. And so she's like, she's thinking he's talking about physical water. She meets him by this well. It's just the lady and Jesus. And now she's saying, sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, go call thy husband and come hither or come back. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saith thou truly, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. You know stuff that you're not supposed to be knowing. You know things that I'm trying to keep secret. You know my secrets. You must be a prophet. And you read the whole story. Jesus gets through with this woman he so revolutionizes this woman's self-concept that she leaves away, she drops her water pots, leaves her water pots by the well, she runs into the city, and she tells, one version says she tells people, come see a man, but another version, one of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luca, John, says Jesus, or the lady says to, the Bible says she goes to tell the men, come see a man. Now in that time, in that culture, women didn't talk to men. Men didn't listen to women. But she had enough boldness and self-awareness and self-confidence and respect that she went and told the men, come see a man, and they followed her. But it all, all of this boldness, all of this confidence, all of this, you know, bravado that this woman possessed came from this moment where Jesus unpacked the theme that this woman was probably desperately trying to hide. When Jesus got her, when Jesus got her to reconcile, to conquer her shame, conquer her pain, conquer her past. And how did he get her to conquer it? By putting it on the table. Now there, I think I have about five points I want to share with you about, you know, just coming to a place in your life. And I don't know what that looks like. I just know the Holy Spirit is really leading me to speak to women who have not reconciled your past, and you're you're still carrying uh, all of this negative energy about who you used to be, and God used all of that to make you who you are. Now, how do you get to a place where you can unpack this? 
Does that mean, does, what does that look like? Does that mean you get on social media and you just kind of throw all of your business out there? No, not necessarily. Probably not in most cases. You know, maybe it means you you go and you sit and you have a real honest conversation with your pastoral leadership. If you have that kind of confidence in whoever that might be. Maybe that means you find a counselor or a therapist. Maybe that means you go and sit with your own mother or your father or your sibling. But somehow the beginnings of the process, the beginning of the process is finding somewhere like Jesus created this scenario for this woman and kind of forced her into, um, you know, just having um, a transparent, transformational moment of unadulterated truth. And when, when she got through, he spoke it for her. She said amen to it. When, when she got through acknowledging it, it ultimately transformed her life. And it's time for you to understand that you are not your mistakes. You are not your mistakes. You know, your mistakes are things that you experienced. And your mistakes really are the things that make you relatable to the world. The world does not relate mostly to our wins. The world relates to our losses. That's why I speak a lot about my personal pain, my personal failures. I speak a lot, you know, and when Lisa's when Lisa chooses to speak, she speaks for herself. But I speak a lot about her particular uh, situations. It's because we've conquered those things. Those things don't define us. And now we use them to connect with the world and the world realizes I'm not here by myself. Well, there are, there are at least five things that I want to share with you that come as a benefit, you know, that comes along with owning you know, standing, stepping into your your pain, your past. Number one, feelings. Once you once you own it, feelings of shame subside. You see, shame. Once you own it, and you're able to say, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm this," you know, "I'm this powerful attorney or doctor or." author or minister or I have this amazing family and I'm I'm an amazing wife and housewife and my children are doing this and doing that but you know if you just followed me back 15 20 years ago into my life this is where I was on the assembly line once you can own that the the feelings of shame subside because there are many of you that are watching me right now. Your crown continues to, to be made crooked because it's the jarring impact of shame that comes in late in the midnight hour and makes you feel like you are an imposter. You are not, you know, you're, you're an actor. Shame is a common emotion that arises from our painful experiences, those experiences of failure. It often makes us feel isolated and unworthy of love, unworthy of belonging. However, when we share our pain with others, we break the silence that shame thrives in. By confessing our pain, we can experience healing and freedom from shame. Again, I have to emphasize, make certain that you, un you begin to unpack this in a safe space. But I'll speak for me, you know, um, my experience with what I'm sharing with you now. Um, I was very ashamed of you know, being 
a teenage father. I was ashamed of the lifestyle I was living, being a womanizer. And when when Holy Spirit really dealt with me and, you know, I got my, helped me to get my life together, I started sharing my experiences. I started sharing the truth about R.C. Blakes Jr. And folk were kind of worried about me because, you know, we, we, we like to speak everybody else's truth. We don't like to talk about our own truth. We, we, like, to, we like to expose other folks' mess. We don't like to expose ours. But, you know, when you're really free from it and you're really delivered from it, and your life has actually evolved beyond it, you really don't have a problem sharing. And I remember, man, I would just tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And everybody was concerned. But what I, what I, what I realized was the more I shared it, the let, I mean, I, the less shame, you know, I, I, I have no shame about my history. My history is nothing but a stepping stone into my destiny. Hmm. I like the way James 5 and 16 reads. He says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There's, there's a healing in the confession. Now, uh, Brene Brown says this, shame cannot survive being spoken it depends on seek it depends on secrecy silence and judgment to grow you see once you speak once you speak your truth and you you address you acknowledge your history your your failures your your pain your mistakes the shame has to dissipate because the shame requires silence Hmm. It's like a it's like a fungus. I think it's fungus that grows in dark, you know, isolated places. I think it's fungus, right? No scientist, but I think it's fungus. And so the the first benefit of just owning your stuff and just reconciling who you were with who you are and and being free is that the feelings of shame will subside. Number two, when you can own your history, when you can own your past, unhealthy beliefs about yourself are corrected. You see, as long as you keep this stuff hidden in the back of your mind and you're, you're still having all of these negative emotions about some experience that you had, some mistake you made, something you went through that the world um, probably used to negatively label you. The, the world stuck a label on you when you were on level three of the assembly line. And so now you always see yourself as that incomplete, uh, you know, uh, fraction of a version of the best of you, when you can look yourself in the mirror and own all parts of you, all of these unhealthy beliefs about yourself are going to be corrected. Painful experiences can often lead to unhealthy beliefs about ourselves, such as feeling unworthy or even unlovable. By sharing our pain with others, we give them the opportunity to challenge these beliefs and offer a more balanced perspective. This can lead to a correction of unhealthy beliefs and a healthier self-concept. When you're able to own it, you then get, um, I'm trying to remember how this was stated. I'm not, uh, the, the person said, I'm not um, who I think I am. I'm not who you think I am. I am in my mind psychologically who I think you think I think 
you think I am. So in other words, it, it boils down to if I have a negative self-concept, I will project that upon the world. And then my interactions with the world will send me the false signal back, confirmation bias, that the world is responding to me exactly the way I think the world thinks about me. When the reality is the world may be looking at me and viewing me as a hero, a genius, a winner. But if in my own mind, because of unprocessed pain, I am viewing you as viewing me as a failure because I view myself as a failure, I will always find something to confirm my particular bias towards myself kind of a tongue twister, but I hope it made sense. But when you're able to share your pain and you're able to say, I was a teen father in a public setting and I did this and I did that, but God cleaned my life up. And you're able to have the experience as a young African-American man of watching people cry because they had rarely ever heard anybody speak their truth like that. When you're able to speak that truth and you're able to see men gravitate to you because they want to be good men, they don't want to be statistics, they don't want to be what the, the status quo, now you realize that speaking your truth and owning your stuff, no longer allowing the shame of your pain and history to control you, but speaking it out, now the world is actually able to give you a different perspective of who you are. Proverbs 23 and 7, the A part of the verse says, for as he thinks in his heart, so he is. See, so I think you think I am what I think I am. See, it's really what's in my subconscious mind you got it. I don't need to belabor that. Uh, Lisa Firestone says, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves can either empower or imprison us. And there are too many of you who are imprisoned by the stories you told yourself about the things you've gone through, the mistakes you've made, and what that means how you're defined by it and all of that kind of stuff. And, and, and you're afraid, you're hiding, you're hiding and you're, you're, you're trying to cover this stuff up. Uh, you know, and, and the reality is that your healing many times is in the people that are closest to you. You think people are going to judge you when people are going to really give you solid perspective on who you are. You've been locked in your head overthinking far too long. And that's the beauty of what? Therapy and counsel. You get a chance to, somebody gets a chance to dig into your life and into your history, get you to a point eventually where you're able to articulate and own your history, and then they're able to give you a healthier and a clearer perspective on who you are. And then you leave out of the session saying, Oh my God, it feels like a thousand pounds off of my shoulders. It's because many times your self-perspective is not going to be corrected. Your unhealthy beliefs about yourself are not going to be corrected until you're able to actually own your stuff. Put it on the table. You know, putting your stuff on the table you know, it, it's going to separate the men from the boys. If you can't handle me because of something in my past, if, if the version of me that you see today is marred because you realize I've had a human experience, I don't need you in my life no way. If you can't accept me as a man of God because, you know, I, I was a teen father 
or I was a womanizer, or I made all of these different mistakes as a man. If you, oh, I can't see him as a man of God. Well, I'm just not deep enough for you. And I'm all right with that. But one thing I do know is that in this life, I'm going to have to be free and I cannot spend the rest of my life running from me. And anybody that I'm going to have in my life is going to have to be able to accept the whole truth and nothing but the truth relative to who I am. Now, point number three, when you're able to, you know, do what Jesus did for this woman, and that is acknowledge and own your painful, negative history. The more you're able to articulate it, and I cannot emphasize enough, within a safe context, this is not a conversation we have at the job. This is not something we blab out on social media. Within a safe context, when you're able to get all of that stuff out, some of you, well, let me not say that. But in, here, in, in point number three, the more you're able to articulate it, the memory becomes less triggering. You disengage triggers when you're able to acknowledge, yeah, I made that mistake. I've had a human experience. Yeah, I got that wrong back then. Yeah, this, this is, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely, that's true. You know? The memory of, her, of it becomes less triggering. I remember before I got free enough to, to really speak my truth relative to what I had gone through. Uh, whenever a preacher would get up and start talking about, you know, unwed parents um, or womanizers, whoremongers, that's Baptist Church King James Version language. I would get very nervous. And when I, when I get nervous, I start sweating and I would just get antsy. But when I was able to speak my truth and own it and recognize in my own mind, yeah, that's where I was. That's what I did. But that didn't define me. That's not who I am. That's not where I am now. That, that, that has no bearing on where I'm going. It no longer triggered me. Painful memories can often be triggered by certain situations or events. By sharing your pain with someone who listens and empathizes, you can feel understood and supported. This can lead to a desensitization of the memory and a reduction in its triggering power. The more I spoke my truth, the more people identified with it. And I, I realized, man, you know, this was just really a trick of the enemy to prevent me from bringing value to the world, to keep me locked in a box in prison, trying to run and hide from myself. I am the 15-year-old the, the, the boy that had a kid. I am that guy. She lives on the other side of Houston, right, with my grandsons. She's here. Yeah, my daughter's here. You know, it doesn't trigger me. It doesn't trigger me. Because when you can own it, the world can't use it against you. Don't make no difference if people telling the truth that you've already told. I remember as a young pastor, um, one of the one of the daughters of the the house came to me after she had really gotten um you know just really locked into the church and really began to see me as her pastor she came to me years later and she said you know pastor when i first came to this church i was in a beauty shop and 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 uh uh people were uh talking about 
your history and the kind of man that you used to be and all of that kind of thing. And, um, and I said, well, you know, I'm going to see, I'm going to go to that church. I'm going to see if he's going to get out the way with me and say, pastor, you never did. You never got out the way with me. And she said, and on top of that, I was able to go back and tell them the same stuff they was talking about in the beauty shop. You were telling us about yourself at church. When you can own your own stuff, other folk can't use it. I like what Galatians 6 and 2 says. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The memory becomes less triggering. And you can now use that thing actually to empower others. Uh, Carl Menninger says, when we are listened to, it creates us, makes us unfold and expand. When you're able to speak it, and people actually hear it, it disengages the triggers because once you feel listened to and heard. Now, point number four, I'm going to try to get out of here earlier today. When you're able to speak it, and I've kind of alluded to this, but I'll make the point. When you're able to speak your truth, own your truth, acknowledge your truth, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you're not around here just trying to put lipstick on a pig. It is what it is. It doesn't make me any, any less accomplished, doesn't di diminish me at all. But point number four, you develop a mastery over the emotion. Because painful emotions can often feel overwhelming and uncontrollable. By sharing our pain with others, we can gain a sense of control over the emotion. This is why you have to learn, you know, I was I was sharing, I forget what where I was, but I was talking, I was talking about uh, dealing with people who um, are victims of narcissistic abuse. You, you don't tell them, get over it. You know, uh, you talking about that again? No, no, no. You have to learn to listen to them because as they are speaking it, they are releasing the toxins of the experience. They are, they are, Overcoming and mastering the emotion, this can lead to a, a mastery over the, the triggers and the things that um, many times cause them to, you know, f fall off the wagon in, in a sense and brings them to a greater sense of resilience in the face of adversity. When, when you can speak it, and you can find a safe place to say it. And in your mind, you can connect the dots that because I was a teen father does not mean I cannot be a great man. I think that was the single most powerful thing my, mm, my dad did for me. Yeah. He said to me, boy, this is very... You know, this is deep right here. He said to me when he discovered that I was getting ready to be a team father. He said, now uh, you've made a mistake. He said, you've made a grown man move as a, as a little boy. So your life is going to change. He says, but don't ever believe that you can't be great because you made a mistake. You're going to go to school and you're going to live out your life's potential. You're just going to have to be a father earlier than you were supposed to. When you're able to speak it, 
it helps you to realize that that thing did not stifle you. Maybe you're still there. It will not stifle you. You just got to acknowledge it so you can leave it and move on into a brilliant future. Romans chapter 8 and 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Dan Millman says, you don't have to control your thoughts. You just have to stop letting them control you. The more you're able to acknowledge it, you develop a mastery over the emotion. <sighs> Number five. Um, and, and, and finally, I'll, I'll conclude it with this. Number five, when you're able to acknowledge it, when you're able to step into it, when you're able to own it, what happens is you ultimately come to this place where I came to. And that is you find the purpose that was always hidden in the pain. Trust me. I don't mean to turn this into a Sunday morning situation, but trust me, God has not allowed you to go through the things you've gone through for nothing. There is some purpose in this pain. When I discovered that God could do more with my mistakes than he ever would do with my getting things right, when I discovered that people connected with my failures much more than they do my successes, I realized that everything I had gone through was purposeful. My pain has not been wasted. I remember the day that Lisa shared her testimony. Um, it was at the first swim meeting, Sisters Winning in Ministry. That's an organization where women in ministry, business, and everything come together. And that's an organization that I founded. It yet goes on today. She shared her testimony at the first gathering of swim. And she didn't know how it was going to be received, but she shared it. And the women that gathered at the altar saying, I've been through this. I, 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 I didn't know how to, I didn't have language for it. I didn't know how to say it. You spoke for me when I listened to you and I listened to your story. Now I have hope. There's, you will always find purpose in the pain. When, when you, when you come to a point where you can say, I'm no less queen because I went through that. What's the, the vision that Holy Spirit gave me years ago? I saw this, this crown, solid gold, but it looked like an ax or something had impacted it and, and, and there, was a, there was a fracture in it. And Holy Spirit says to me, he says, is the crown of less value because it's been impacted, because there's a fracture in it? I said, no, the crown is of no less value because the crown is made of solid gold. Its value is innate. No incident, no situation, no experience can shift the value of the crown. Your pain, the, the devil has lied to you, made you believe that your pain, that your experience, that your mistake, whatever it is, somehow subtracts from your value. But sharing your pain with others can lead to a greater sense of purpose and meaning in life by using your pain to help others who are going through similar experiences. You can turn your pain into a powerful mission. Right? 
You just got to own it. You got to stop running from it. You got to disengage these triggers. You got to stop having to hold your breath in rooms because you're afraid somebody's going to find this out or find that out. I like what 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4 says. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us, comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. God brought you through it, not for you to hide from it, but for you to find purpose in the pain and to help somebody else who's going through the very thing that you went through. Uh, Khalil Gibran says, out of suffering have emerged the strongest souls. The most massive characters are seared with scars. Your scars, my brother's song says, your scars let us know or let you know that I survived. It's nothing to be ashamed of. Stop running from your history. Stop, stop running from your history. Stop being ashamed of the journey you've taken in life. All things have worked together for your good, but not only for your good, but for the good of those that you will encounter. So I say to you, my sister, be free. Be free. Be free. Don't let the world, don't let men, don't let society, don't let the toxic sisterhood hold you down based on memories or the things you've experienced, be free. Just be free. May I pray for you today? I feel Holy Spirit here today, my God. I feel Holy Spirit here today. Father, I thank you for this gathering of queens and kings from all around the world. And now, Father, my prayer is that you will allow the, the touch of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, to rest upon each of them. And I command their souls to be made free. Those, dear God, that have been struggling with memories and shame and guilt, God, I thank you for freeing them now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Move in that room and touch them now, Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Now listen, if you need counseling, if you look in the description, there's a link for better help counseling. If you utilize that link um, and uh, you decide to use better help, it will afford you 10% off of the cost of their counseling. I recommend them because I'm not a counselor, right? I'm no mental health professional. And if you utilize them, not only will it afford you 10% off of the cost of counseling, but it will also, BetterHelp will also make a deposit into R.C. Blake's ministries because I recommended them to you. Now, don't forget to go by Amazon, pick up my all of my books, Queenology, Kingology, um, Soul Ties, Father, Daughter, Talk, um, my latest book, Me, My, Mine, go by there and uh, pick, up, pick up my books. Uh, when you buy my books, you are blessing the ministry and you're empowering us to be able to go further. Uh, also go to the website, rcblakes.com, sign up for the mailing list. If you had been on the mailing list, you would have gotten the, the, the printout for the, the study guide or the the worksheet, should I say, rather, for the discussion today, you would have got notification that I was that we were coming on. You just need to be on the mailing list. And while you're there, also check out all of the online programs. 
that are there. I want to thank God for all of you who always support us, continue to support Lisa and I. You're constantly sowing into our lives. We love you and we appreciate you more than words can communicate. And until next time, but before we do that, do not leave this room without liking this video. I don't know why it's so hard for y'all to just press the button and say like. I need you to like this video. With all of these algorithms changing and everything, I need as many people liking these videos as possible to keep these messages in front of the masses. So make certain that you like this before you leave out and share this on you know, Facebook, take the link and share it on Facebook, share it on Twitter, you know, copy the link and send it to your friend through a text message. Get this word out and just know that Lisa and I love you. You're on top and you're going higher. God has more in store for you. So guess what? We will see you at the top. God bless you until next time. We here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you for spending this time with us today. R.C. and Lisa are always honored to have you with us. Don't forget to reach out to us by visiting our website at www.rcblakes.com. While you are there, you may join our mailing list and receive a free download of the Laws of Manifesting Your Vision by R.C. Blakes. Also look at all of the online programs by R.C. You may find all books written by R.C. and Lisa. Once again, all of us here at R.C. Blake's Ministries want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts. And as we always say, see you at the top.